Good afternoon. Um, I'm Alatunde Johnson. I'm a professor here at Columbia Law School. And also this year, I'm vice dean for intellectual life. And my role this afternoon is simply to um, introduce this panel and welcome um, all of you. This panel is jointly sponsored by the Center for Constitutional Governance and the Dean's Initiative on Lawyers, Community, and Impact. And you'll hear more about the center in a moment. I just wanted to say a few words about the Lawyers, Community, Impact Initiative. Um, it's essentially an initiative to bring our legal community together to address issues of public importance. And we knew that this was an election year, so um, we chose a theme this year of democracy, and we've been putting together programs all year around this theme of democracy starting with our very first panel, which was on voter ID issues and other um, uh, things that were affecting democratic participation and inclusion. After the election, we've had a series of programs on um, how the election is shaping issues with regard to the international legal order, um, internet and media, immigration, and, and healthcare. Um, so this joint program with the Center for Constitutional Governance is part of this ongoing conversation. And we're really happy to welcome to this event um, not just our on-campus community, students, faculty, and uh, administrators, but also some alums. And it's really nice to see um, alums in the room. I, I think it's always nice to offer CLE credit if that's the way we get to see you, as well as um, lawyers out there in the community, some of you um, um, who may not have been to Columbia before, welcome. Um, this is quite clearly an important time for us as lawyers and as students of law. Um, it's a time in which many of us believe that the strength of our constitutional democracy is being tested. Um, I think for all of us, it's really a time in which we're, we're called upon to stretch ourselves. I know that over the last couple of months, there are lots of things people have asked me questions about, and I've thought initially, oh, I actually don't know that. I don't do this area of the law. And I realize that we don't really have that luxury um, um, anymore. Many of us as um, in the alumni community, um, some of um, our alums who are immigration lawyers, but also some who are not immigration lawyers, rush to help those affected um, by um, the travel ban. Not all of us will want to participate in this way, but I think as lawyers, we do have a particular responsibility to really right now read, um, to engage, um, to learn new areas of the law, um, to listen to different perspectives and interpretations, and to participate during this critical time. So I'm really happy to see such a, a big house tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jillian Metzger, who's faculty director of the Center for Constitutional Governance. Um, professor Metzger is a Stanley H. Fold professor of law at our law school, and many of you know um, she writes and teaches in the area of constitutional law, administrative law, and federal courts. So let me turn it over to Professor Metzger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aliti. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I am actually on sabbatical this uh, semester, and I have to say this is one of the few events that I thought, oh, I really want to come and be here for. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the conversation. Um, uh, as Alti mentioned, I am the faculty director of the Center for Constitutional Governance, um, which, as its title might suggest to you, uh, does uh, work, holds events, um, holds conferences, uh, uh, engages um, uh, in legal, uh, disputes uh, through writing briefs, um, undertake some advocacy um, in the areas of constitutional law and a lot about administrative governance. So in the past, we have had conferences that focused on polarization and administration. We've had conferences that targeted um, financial regulation and its relationship to administrative law. We've um, had conferences that that most recently focused on inequality and the constitutional significance of inequality. And um, as we go forward in the period that we are now in, um, uh, the constitutional issues raised by the Trump administration um, seems likely to be added to the center's agenda. Um, and this is the first event as part of that. Um, it is now day 61 of the presidency of Donald Trump. Um, it has been, I think we can all say, an eventful 61 days. Um, uh, it doesn't look like the pace of events is going to uh, calm down at all anytime soon. Um, uh, and when you think about the issues that we've been confronting, uh, they are 
both political and legal and, and almost um, inextricably intertwined. Um, we have some that are really predominantly happening in the political arena, the um, Affordable Care Act's uh, potential repeal and replace, the investigation into Russia and its involvement in our elections. We have some others that are right now very definitely in the courts, the challenges to the immigration ban, um, some challenges uh, that have been brought uh, by San Francisco, Santa Clara County to the sanctuary city um, portions of President Trump's executive order. Um, and we have some issues that we see looming but, but are not yet in the, in the courts, may never get to the courts, um, may not actually be as legal, may be more political. And sort of sorting through which of these issues really are predominantly uh, legal and constitutional, which are more political, how we should conceive of them um, is one of the issues that we hope to get to today. Um, and with us to uh, try and address these questions are an array of Columbia's finest, um, who I hope are familiar to all of you. I am going to list them very briefly um, because if I start listing all of their accomplishments, we will have no time for conversation. Um, they are on my left, uh, starting with Professor Bowman Posen. Um, uh, next to her is Alex Abdo, uh, who is a st staff attorney at the Knight Institute, uh, First Amendment Institute. Institution or institute? In institute, okay. Um, uh, then uh, to my right, uh, Professor Thomas Merrill, the Charles Evan Hughes Professor of Law. Um, and to his right, Christina Rodriguez um, from the Yale Law School who is visiting here uh, this semester. And of course, Professor Johnson. So uh, without further ado, what we thought we would do is begin um, by having uh, some uh, uh, questions and discussion among the panelists. Um, each of the panelists actually has some real expertise in particular areas that um, have been in the news. Um, I'm going to start with Professor Rodriguez, who many of you may know, is a leading immigration law um, scholar uh, in, uh, in the country and is actually um, in the process of publishing. Is it out yet? No. Uh, a book looking at the president's power over immigration, um, uh, which really could not be more timely. Um, uh, and the Knight Institute, um, where Alex is, focuses on First Amendment issues. And so what we thought we'd do is begin by having a conversation among ourselves, getting some of the issues on the table, getting some background, um, and then uh, after a bit, turn over and get some questions from you all. So um, I wanted to start, uh, Christina, um, with you. Um, uh, and uh, the issue that I think is probably most on people's immediate attention, the immigration ban. We now have um, are on version 2.0 of the immigration ban, um, and we have had litigation um, that went up to the Ninth Circuit on the first one, currently have decisions in Hawaii and Maryland, both of which issued a nationwide injunction against the second um, uh, executive order on immigration. Um, I was hoping maybe you could talk to us a little bit about those decisions, about the orders, and what you see as the constitutional issues involved. Sure. So first, I should apologize for having to leave at 5 o'clock. It's not a protest, um, <laughs> but hopefully I'll get to hear a lot of the discussion. The, the order 2.0 does a couple of things. It prohibits the entry for 90 days of nationals from six Muslim-majority countries. The first version included seven countries. Iraq has been taken off the list for some diplomatic and humanitarian reasons. The order explains that the reason for the inclusion of those countries is the risk of terrorism that arises in those six places and the facts of instability on the ground that contribute to that risk. The order also, in contrast to the initial order, um, expands and details a wide array of waivers that immigration officials can um, apply if someone on an individual basis has a compelling reason to enter. And the order also suspends the entry of refugees for 120 days, but unlike the first order, no longer suspends the entry of Syrian refugees indefinitely. Um, so the the changes to the order were an attempt to address the concerns that were raised in litigation, but I think uh, they've proven to be only partially successful, those efforts. The first thing that uh, the administration was able to cure, and that, that probably will hold, is that it made clear in the second order that it wasn't barring the going to and from the United States of people who were lawful permanent residents or had valid visas from the designated countries. And there were serious due process concerns uh, that arose as the result of that. And so they've essentially cured 
that problem, which on, on one level is disappointing because this case could have been a vehicle for clarifying the parameters of the due process rights of, uh, of immigrants who hold temporary visas. But I think most people will, will take the rescission of the order rather than uh, wait for the exciting litigation uh, to unfold. The um, part of the order that remains uh, vulnerable is just the decision not to permit the entry of people from these six majority countries, Muslim majority countries. And there are basically two grounds on which the courts have found the uh, decision to be impermissible. The first is statutory, and it's a limited ground. The Immigration and Nationality Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of national origin, race, and other factors in the issuance of what are called immigrant visas. So that's, that basically means a green card. So it's impermissible uh, to discriminate on the grounds of where you're from in issuing a green card. And so there's a subset of the people covered who by statute uh, ought not to be subject to an order of this kind. The second is really the more interesting set, uh, presents the more interesting set of issues. That's the constitutional route. And there are a variety of claims that have been brought in the courts to challenge the exclusion on the basis of national origin, equal protection claims, free exercise claims, and uh, establishment clause claims. And the courts seem to be coalescing around the establishment clause as the potential problem with the decision by the Trump administration, basically concluding that for a variety of reasons, the order reflects a denigration of Islam or an anti-Muslim bias that is essentially disfavoring a religion in violation of the Establishment Clause. So there, there are three things that are interesting about these developments. Uh, the first is that both the, the cases in relation to the first order, but also the Hawaii decision and the Maryland decision in relation to 2.0, show the court's willingness to scrutinize judgments made in the context of immigration. Basically, beginning to put to rest the notion that decisions made in the immigration realm are not subject to meaningful constitutional review. And so that alone, the fact that the courts have been willing to engage in that kind of review has surprised some uh, immigration law scholars, but I think actually is very consistent with the way in which the courts have generally been moving. Uh, and so now there is a debate between whether immigration judgments, especially those made by the executive in a national security context, should be subject to a standard that they be facially legitimate and done for a bona fide reason, or whether some other heightened standard of review ought to apply when a constitutional interest like the Establishment Clause is at stake. The second thing that's interesting as a development is uh, something that I think has been at the center of the conversation, and that's the extent to which statements by Trump and his surrogates about this being a Muslim ban or uh, something to protect the United States from Islam or Muslims who hate America is relevant to the constitutional analysis. You have in both the Hawaii case and the Maryland case judges saying that the doctrine requires us to take a kind of context, and the context includes uh, clear statements by a, they don't use this term, but an undisciplined president uh, explaining that his main motivation is a concern about Muslims in Islam. You also, importantly, have in uh, the Ninth Circuit a dissent from the denial of rehearing in the first travel ban case. It starts to get very confusing how to keep these all in order. Uh, a dissent that says that what matters is the deliberations that went on in drafting the order. And all of these extramural statements during the campaign or by Rudy Giuliani or Stephen Miller or and any other person uh, not as part of the debate aren't actually relevant. Um, and in fact, according to one judge in the Ninth Circuit, could actually be harmful to take into consideration because it would legalize uh, the political process in a way that could be damaging. Um, so I think the difficult, interesting question here is how broadly do we define the context that we should take into account? It's clear under Establishment Clause doctrine, under Equal Protection doctrine, that when trying to determine intent, a context beyond the four corners of the order matters, but how far do we draw that context and what kinds of statements actually matter? Do we have to scrutinize each of the statements to say, to determine whether they actually reflect anti-Muslim bias? Um, and the last, the third thing that I think is interesting about these cases 
and it, it may be that this is one off in, in this instance, but the court's willingness to actually appear behind the national security judgments of the administration, there's a lot of language in the decisions about how there is no true national security purpose here. And you don't typically see courts saying that when the administration claims a national security justification. And I think it's the combination of the lack of interagency deliberation when the first uh, order was rolled out, the failure to consult the intelligence community, and then the overbreadth of the ban on all nationals from all these six countries that are highly suggestive to the courts. There's not really a national security motivation, but something else going on, thus leading to the kind of heightened constitutional scrutiny that's happening. I, I think that this could be a one-off precisely because the rollout of these orders uh, was so unorganized um, and unlike what you would see in most administrations. Uh, but it could result in the development of doctrine that would be useful in scrutinizing uh, immigration judgments in the future. Yes, sir. Alex or Tom, you want to weigh in? Um, so I, 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 very nice job. And I, I uh, applaud you for highlighting the issue of the, uh, the role of the presidential statements. Uh, because uh, I haven't been involved in this very deeply, but I, I read this, this second order and, uh, you know, it was carefully scrubbed and lawyered and so forth. And so the thought occurred to me on reading it that if, if this order had been issued by President Barack Obama, there's no way that any judge in this United States would have declared it unconstitutional. Uh, because it's framed in terms of these particular nations, there's no mention of, you know, religion. Uh, there's a discussion about, uh, you know, inadequate vetting of visa applicants in these countries and so forth. So it seemed all quite, quite legitimate. Uh, so, and, and I read the Hawaii case where the judges basically only reason for declaring this potentially unconstitutional was sort of saying on, on the merits it might be held unconstitutional. Um, were all these presidential statements and what Rudy Giuliani said on some TV show and so on and so forth. And, and you know, this, uh, I find myself uneasy about this. Um, and it, it actually reminded me of the case you're very familiar with, Texas versus United States, where the Fifth Circuit declared the DAPA program uh, invalid because uh, it should have been a legislative rule that went through notice and comment. Can you and say what DAPA is? I'm not sure I understand. What is DAPA? <laughs> what, is it, what does it stand for? It's Deferred Action for Parents. parents uh, Right. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right. It's deferral of removal of right. dreamers. Yeah. Right. Dreamers' yeah. parents. Yeah. Right. No, no, citizens. Like citizens. Yeah. Citizens. Yeah. 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 Anyway, the the uh, the primary legal issue in that case was whether the uh, uh, the program uh, should have gone through notice and comment as a formal regulation or whether it was just a policy statement uh, that didn't have to go through notice and comment. And the Fifth Circuit, in deciding the issue, uh, quotes the president. <laughs> This is the case, President Obama, a couple of times. It says, it quotes him as saying that, um, uh, you know, that he had spoken about uh, employees of the Homeland Security Office, and he said that uh, uh, if they didn't follow the policy, there would be consequences, and they've got a problem. So this was sort of suggesting that the president thought this was a legally binding order as opposed to a policy statement. And then later in the opinion, they say that. Um, uh, the president explained that it was the failure of Congress to enact the program that prompted him to change the law. So again, suggesting that it was a legal change. So here the Fifth Circuit's relying on these sort of public relations statements that the president of the United States makes in announcing this program as a way to impugn the legality of the program. Now you've got this Hawaiian, I didn't read, haven't read the Maryland case, but the Hawaiian case says that, you know, these, uh, you know, Ill, in, intemperate and poorly conceived statements by the president and his henchmen like Giuliani uh, raise a question of whether or not this is unconstitutional. And I, I just find that kind of creepy, I guess. I don't know. Can I, can I actually um, add to I mean, one of the interesting things that the uh, Hawaiian order and the Maryland order, which are very similar in their reasoning, made me think of is that part of what I think is so jarring about President Trump is the extent to which well-established norms are being cast aside. Um, norms, for example, that you don't issue an executive order without consulting the relevant agencies and getting people and get vetting it through <coughs> the internal market. Or, but even more, norms that you don't say things like we're going to ban Muslims, that that's not a keeping with our constitutional culture. Um, and sometimes these norms can't be easily enforced by courts, and we wouldn't want them to. They're, they're, they're this, 
very important surround of values that we have that um, make the system work in a lawful way, but aren't usually ones that courts come in to enforce. And one way of understanding these courts, I, I actually agree with you, Tom, I don't think if you'd have been from Obama, um, I think the reason that they would have reached the same result, and I think that's because they had a sense of Obama as being constitutionally committed and credible in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we might be seeing in some way is judicial efforts at norm enforcement, um, which may be overturned because doctrinally, you don't necessarily want to go this way looking behind the order, but that there's a real sense of unease in the courts about how do you preserve a, a robust constitutional culture um, that is really built on, on practice. It's internal to government and to, and to public discourse, um, and you don't want it to be something that the courts are responsible for enforcing, but yet, if they don't, what are they sanctioning? And I think that might be some of the dilemma that they're confronting. But how does the government keep functioning for four years if the president violates every norm <laughs> no, known to our, our, our civilization in the course of some tweet between now and the end of the presidency? Uh, probably between now and the end of the panel, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the, the, the juxtaposition of pre Trump's statements with President Obama's statements in hi his immigration enforcement policies suggests why it's crucial that as these cases make their way through litigation, that courts be careful about the way they read the statements and not just assume that anything that touches on general concern about uh, terrorism or, or Islamism, however people are framing it, um, that that is not enough uh, to constitute um, evidence of intent to discriminate. Uh, that said, I think that where um, intent is a relevant part of the doctrinal analysis, that these kinds of statements are probative. Um, and th the question that I don't know the answer to, and that the courts sort of flag but don't give an answer to, is that at some point the administration an administration is capable of kind of cleansing its actions of those original intents, but what is it going to take for the Trump administration to do that? And clearly, neither the Hawaii nor Maryland courts think that this 2.0 order accomplishes that. But I think that has a lot to do with your point, Jillian, about distrusting the processes by, through which this administration <coughs> is developing um, its immigration, this particular immigration policy. The Ninth Circuit's dissent from denial of rehearing gives you the roadmap that a court could follow if it assumes that we have a normally functioning executive branch. And if, um, if we do eventually have that kind of executive branch or just more confidence that things are working through ordinary interagency processes, then you're more likely to get that kind of opinion that just assumes the executive as an abstract entity as opposed to peering behind this particular executive and taking into account the particular actions of this presidency. But I, I agree that it's remarkable that, that that's actually informing legal judgments. Um, I'm yes, actually going to, yeah, please do. Yeah, I was going to stand up because I can't actually see all of you. So. actually illustrates because if we're going to say if President Obama issued this executive order, no court would strike it down, is that assuming um, President Obama with the same intent, whatever it is, that the Trump administration has issued this executive order, it seems like it's actually packing in a different set of assumptions about whether we look to purpose or intent at all. If we're going to look to purpose or intent at all, then it seems that the statements that have been made by the President and his surrogates, not only just during the campaign, but since the election and since assuming the presidency, are relevant. We may not, maybe in Tom's view, we may not want to take all of these thrown off statements very seriously. It seems to speak to the weight of the evidence and, and what kind of uh, standard will apply in weighing the evidence. Um, but the fact that if Obama had issued this uh, executive order, it wouldn't be struck down, seems to speak to the fact that Obama wouldn't have issued the executive order that the courts think this is. It's sort of a, I think, a, a, a hypothetical that packs a lot in, that's all I was gonna say. And I think just to follow up on that, um, it's interesting to think about what would happen if you were outside of the context in which you're examining intent as part of the doctrinal framework. Um, and, you know, typically in national security determinations, courts defer significantly to the executive. Uh, and there's a portion of the, you know, the travel ban litigation that touches upon that, which is the extent to which the courts actually thought there was a national security justification. That may be a better bellwether for how courts will respond with this kind of inertial pull toward, you know, back toward the median of norms um, than how it analyzes the intent framework under, you know, uh, uh, you know under the First Amendment. Um, and that's what, you know, what I'll be looking for and be curious to kind of see how the courts analyze.
Um, just one thought on that. I was struck today that when they issued the new travel advisory and the countries from which you aren't allowed to have something bigger than an iPhone, it's not the same countries as the travel ban, right? So, I mean, there's an interesting juxtaposition just there when they seem to be doing something that's responding to current national security information, it actually has a different, a, a slightly different feel to it. Um, I want to actually, uh, uh, Jessica, turn to the question of the sanctuary cities. Um, I, and, but, I, but there's an interesting point here going off of something Tom said, which was you talked about uh, Texas versus United States. And one of the things we're seeing um, during the Obama administration, uh, Texas sued the Obama administration, I believe, 46 times. Um, there was the group of 26 plus uh, conservative uh, run uh, state governments that were regularly suing uh, President Obama and his administration. And um, not surprisingly, we've got a new set of litigators um, in court these days. Um, and one of the areas where we're likely to see some state and local uh, attacks on, the, on what the Trump administration is trying to do is the sanctuary city issue. So would you mind sort of giving us some background yeah, sure. there? Um, I'll talk about that, and I'll say, I think it's not just that we see now blue states serving this uh, role that red states were serving in the Obama administration of suing um, the, the federal government, but they're, they're doing also uh, quite frequently, including in this context, something very similar, which is particularly singling out the president and executive power and attempting to challenge just that piece of what's happening vis-a-vis -vis Congress and vis-a-vis the, re the rest of the federal government, which has been um, a somewhat interesting development. Okay, so backing up for a second on sanctuary cities, um, turning to the executive order, which is called Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States, um, that Donald Trump signed on January 25th of this year. Um, this is the executive order that is understood widely to attempt, um, and I can talk about the extent to which it may in fact do so, to single out jurisdictions understood to be uh, not complying with, hindering cooperation with the federal government um, in its immigration enforcement. But there are a lot of questions about exactly what the executive order does um, and what it purports even to do. So the most controversial section of the executive order so far is section nine, um, which in relevant part says, the Attorney General and the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, in their discretion and to the extent consistent with law, shall ensure that jurisdictions that willfully refuse to comply with 8 U.S.C. Section 1373, sanctuary jurisdictions, are not eligible to receive federal grants except as deemed necessary for law enforcement purposes by the Attorney General or the Secretary. Um, and this section also directs the Office of Management and Budget to provide information on all federal grant money that currently is received by any sanctuary jurisdiction. So the order, even in that small section that I read, and certainly when read in the rest of the context, um, is, is quite unclear on at least two critical matters. So the first is, what is a sanctuary jurisdiction? There's no commonly accepted definition. There's not one in the US Code, which the executive order refers to. There's not one in the executive order itself. Um, the order seems to define sanctuary jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis a provision of the United States Code, um, 8 U.S.C. Section 1373, which says um, basically that governments, state and local as well as federal, can't restrict their officials or sub-entities from sharing information um, with the feder federal government um, about immigration status. Um, but elsewhere in the executive order, there are references um, to detainer requests and to jurisdictions that are not complying with detainer requests, which are requests um, from ICE to these local jurisdictions to keep in custody individuals past the date which they would be released uh, for 48 hours so that ICE can decide whether to take them into federal custody. Um, there's also some references to the secretary designating in his discretion um, a sanctuary jurisdiction. Um, so one question, again, that's very fundamental is what counts as a sanctuary jurisdiction under this executive order? And a second question is what kind of penalty does the executive order seek to impose? Um, it's, it's clear um, that it's trying to tie some kind of funding um, restriction, funding penalty to the existence of uh, a jurisdiction being a sanctuary jurisdiction. Um, and there are references to all federal grant money, um, but there are also some narrower references to other kinds of federal grants. Um, so as uh, Jillian mentioned at the outset, taking I think a quite strong reading of the executive order. Some jurisdictions have gone to court seeking 
um, both declaratory and injunctive relief, so including San Francisco and Santa Clara out in California, um, and they are raising a variety of constitutional arguments about this executive order, including um, a separation of powers argument uh, that the president is effectively usurping Congress's spending clause power um, in seeking to impose these funding restrictions, um, that even if this were done by Congress rather than the president and, then, and thus not presenting a separation of powers concern, it would nonetheless, uh, this order would nonetheless exceed even Congress's spending clause power insofar as it's coercive um, and unrelated to certain kinds of federal objectives in the federal programs that may be at issue. Um, and thirdly, um, an anti-commandeering argument about federalism, uh, maintaining that the executive order is trying to coerce the states into helping to administer the federal immigration laws. Um, my own view is that while some of these constitutional arguments have merit in the abstract and that actually s Section 1373 may itself um, be unconstitutional, they're not really in play in this executive order and they should probably not be in play here. I think the litigation, um, in some ways responding to the sort of government by chaos strategy uh, perhaps of uh, this executive order in the first place, I think is really overreading the executive order. Again, that may be the intent of the executive order. It's hard to say, uh, but I think the better reading of the executive order itself is that a sanctuary jurisdiction is one that is, quote, willfully, unquote, refusing to comply with federal law rather than simply um, one that may not be cooperating in other respects, for example, with respect to detainers, um, and that not, um, uh, certainly not all federal funding of these localities would be um, at issue. Um, but that's not to minimize the, the effects of the executive order on these jurisdictions um, that are reading it as a suggestion of administration's um, intent, its purposes with respect to uh, its relationship with these jurisdictions. Uh, one of the things I think the executive order is doing, which we've seen in some other executive orders and statements as well, um, is basically seeking to embolden local and state officials, lower level officials, and lower level federal officials to, um, to enforce immigration law to the maximum extent, um, to feel sort of free to do that without constraints of supervision uh, that had been imposed previously. Um, so I think there's a lot more to say about this, and maybe I'll stop there and we can yeah, discuss. Do you wanna, do you wanna jump in on this? Yeah, so I'll say, um, I agree with Jessica that this part of the Interior Enforcement Executive Order is something of a paper tiger, there's more uh, bark than bite, whatever metaphor you wanna use, and I, I think that it, generally speaking with these orders, it's important to distinguish between the elements of them that have actual legal effect or express a policy of the administration that could through its own executive tools have an effect on the on the world and those that are meant as political statements or intentions of uh, how they would seek to interact say with Congress or with uh, state local jurisdictions that otherwise would want to cooperate with them um, and in in the case of the the sanctuary jurisdictions uh, the cases are going to come down to whether Section 1373 is, is constitutional, I think. Because I don't, I don't think that there's a claim, and I'm sure you would agree, that a locality can defy federal law. And so if it's a valid federal law, then it's permissible, at least prospectively, for the government, whether it's the president or Congress, to attach consequences to the violation of that law. Um, so th then the question is, do we want to expand existing federalism doctrine to restrict the federal government's ability to control how officials at the state local level act and what implications might that have for other areas of law and policy? And I think one of the dangers of this kind of litigation is the fa failure to see how expanding existing doctrines could have repercussions in, in other domains. And, and it's crucial that we think about those questions. And that, I think, Christina, that's actually a really important um, theme that a lot of uh, <coughs> progressive challengers are going to have to start grappling with because if you think about spending power, right, the spending power is how we've enforced a lot of civil rights um, obligations. It's a critical uh, tool on the federal government um, uses uh, to ensure accountability to its programs um, with state and local contractors. And there is a danger, I think, of expanding the existing doctrine. Um, uh, going back to your point, Jessica, about you know, if you don't need to, if there's a reading that's available that's that's narrower, um, 
uh, it's one worth pursuing, and it may very well be one that the courts are willing to pursue, even assuming you could, I mean, there is this question about uh, whether or not you can get into court just on the executive order, um, or whether you need something like more guidance or something that shows that the, that the administration is actually going to enforce it in the way that the executive order suggests. Yeah, there, there, right, there may be ripeness questions as, as well. I mean, it does seem in the, the strategy here, one thing that's happening, I think, by litigators is they're attempting to slot this executive order, which is, again, I don't know whether because of a degree of, of lack of attention and lack of care or a deliberate strategy, I can't tell, um, but where a lot of the moves are not actually familiar moves, either via separate, vis -vis separation of powers or vis-a-vis -vis federalism, um, to, but to attempt to slot them nonetheless into these familiar and comfortable frameworks of the allocation of power between the president and Congress or between the states and the federal um, government. Um, but what's happening here is not what you might think, I think, from reading some of these documents, that the federal government has created this provision, 1373, and attached a financial condition to it, and now is through the executive branch retroactively, coercively attempting to pile a lot of other conditions on it, which would sound um, a little bit like, um, at, at least in the court's reading, um, without the executive dimension, the, uh, the Medicaid expansion mm -hmm. and the court's decision in that case. So we're attempting to sort of shoehorn this into that framework, but that's not what's happening here because, Christine, as you said, 1373 is not a spending provision in the first place. So there is a question, is it itself unconstitutional? The uh, Second Circuit was asked that question uh, by New York City a while back and said no, but there are still some arguments available, I think, on that front that need to be played out and taken seriously. But if we're going to assume that that is a constitutional provision, then some of the spending arguments don't quite fit, and it's really a question of what tools does the executive branch have to ensure <coughs> compliance with valid federal law, which is a very different question from how does spending clause doctrine work. Um, uh, another area, um, Alex, turn to your uh, areas of expertise. Um, uh, there's so much that one could talk about <laughs> on the First Amendment front. Um, uh, so really take your pick, fake news, White House access, um, uh, you know, um, leaks, another great right. issue. Um, my favorite as an administrative law person is the deep state um, uh, uh, and its deconstruction. So really, you know, go, go to town. So, so may, maybe what I'll do is just list a couple of ones that I, I'm focused on as particular concerns, you know, about the First Amendment under Trump and quickly go through them. But before doing that, I think, um, you know, I'd want to identify the thread that I think runs through all of them, which goes back to something that you said earlier, uh, Jillian, which is that, Underlying, I think, much of the anxiety uh, about the Trump administration is the realization uh, that uh, individual liberties depend so much for their protection on norms rather than law. Uh, and I think that is particularly true when it comes to uh, free expression uh, and dissent. And it's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm particularly concerned about this area, uh, because it, it's an area in which someone intent on changing norms can do quite a bit of damage, at least initially. Uh, and how successful that person would be, I think, will depend on the strength of those norms, uh, whether those norms rely on different sorts of institutional checks like the deep state, um, uh, and whether courts you know, uh, will fill the gap as they have perhaps in the context of a travel ban. Um, so maybe I'll just highlight a couple of the ones that I'm, that I'm uh, am most focused on. The first uh, has to do with the Espionage Act. Um, the Espionage Act uh, is a fairly broad criminal prohibition on the disclosure of certain sorts of information, often by government officials, but not necessarily in several of its provisions. Uh, so it's written in very broad terms in a way that could apply to both whistleblowers uh, uh, and even to journalists. Historically, we haven't seen those types of prosecutions. The prosecutions have largely been limited to government employees who have violated their secrecy obligations to the government. Uh, but that has, again, more to do with the norms of the enforcement of the law rather than the, the text of the law as it is written. Uh, and so I think a critical question will be uh, is how durable those norms are. Will we see a prosecution of a journalist uh, for disclosing classified information about NSA surveillance or about any of the other numerous topics that you read about in the New York Times or the journal every day. Uh, you know, those stories very often rely on leaks of classified information from uh, government officials. Uh, and we, again, haven't seen those prosecutions. The Trump administration has gestured toward them. We still haven't seen them, but we may. And if so, I think that'll be a, a cause for serious concern. Uh, the second area is something that maybe is not on too many people's lists, but is on mine, which is uh, the question of material support prosecutions. Uh, this is another area where there is extraordinary uh, leeway in the executive. Uh, ever since the Supreme Court's decision in, in Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, the government has had fairly broad authority to uh, 
uh, prosecute individuals for speech activities taken in coordination with designated terrorist groups. Uh, and they have kind of two axes of leeway that, that cause me concern. One is that there's significant leeway for the government to designate groups as terrorist uh, groups. Uh, and, you know, for example, the administration is now reportedly considering uh, designating the Muslim Brotherhood, which is uh, a, a, an entity that is kind of has various instantiations, it has social and political elements to it, uh, and is very different than the one that most people think of historically as, uh, as being exclusively concerned with violence. Uh, and if it were to be designated, I think that would have far-reaching consequences for political discourse. And another uh, kind of axis of, of discretion that the executive has in this area uh, is in kind of deciding what coordination means under the, uh, uh, under the Supreme Court's decision in Humanitarian Law Project. The lower courts have not really sorted that out yet, which at least for the time being has left considerable discretion in the hands of prosecutors to decide who to prosecute or who to investigate. Um, and, uh, and that is another cause, I think, for concern. Those are kind of the two ones where I think if, the, if something materializes, we'll see it most quickly. Uh, there are two other ones that I think we will not see it quite as quickly, and so maybe for that reason concern me more. Um, the, the, the threats are more clandestine, so to speak. Uh, the first of those is surveillance. I think sur you know, surveillance poses uh, uh, an important threat or a, a significant threat to free expression because of the way it can chill free inquiry and free expression. Uh, people change their behavior when watch. Just before this panel was starting, we were having a conversation up here over whether uh, we were going to be broadcast or recorded, and that might change the nature of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's not a surprise that people act differently when they're monitored. Uh, uh, what most people don't realize is how uh, lax the restrictions are on executive surveillance. Um, so for example, if the government were investigating uh, a journalist for one of these Espionage Act investigations, there are significant tools available for the government to pursue that journalist. Uh, they could subpoena their phone records uh, from their telephone companies, they could execute some other type of legal process for their email records, all in support of uh, an Espionage Act prosecution. There are regulations that have limited those sorts of investigations uh, uh, in the FBI, but those regulations are subject to change. Um, uh, and so I'm concerned about uh, surveillance. And the final area is, is secrecy. Um, you know, a kind of surprising feature of our democracy uh, is that uh, we have no legal entitlement to most of what we learn about the government. Um, we learn so much about the government uh, from leaks to the press or from statutory rights of access to government information. Uh, and all of those are subject to significant discre discretion or uh, you know, legal coercion in the case of leaks. Uh, whether this administration will <coughs> clamp down on those kind of modes of access to the government, to government information, I think remains to be seen. Uh, but, but it is a kind of a more insidious threat to, I think, self-governance that we should all be watching. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. I, I guess the last thing I'll say is, how concerned about this we should all be, I think, depends. It depends on you know, the questions we've been discussing, which is the extent to which uh, courts are deferential to the executive or not. Uh, and it may be that you know, the, the last two months of litigation over the travel ban indicate that they're willing to push back um, in areas where they have historically not. Uh, that may be cause for uh, you know, hope in this area, although maybe long-term uh, you know, concern <laughs> about structures. I actually want to, um, I mean, I do think it's a really good example of, of the kind of norm and, and internal law aspect of government that, that I don't think gets often enough attention, but that so much of the regularity and protections um, and constraints against abuse of power are ones that the executive branch often has put on itself um, uh, or have emerged over time through practices, but then are subject to change. and. Um, it's, it's not just that you could change the regulation, but that when you start seeing the administrative state as the enemy, then adhering to long established patterns of behavior um, is sort of kowtowing to the enemy's control as opposed to this kind of regularity that may matter with a, with a value attached. So there's a corrosive aspect, not even just limited, I think, to the security context, but to this, cons this idea of a lot of um, the sort of leakers or others in the administration as being the enemy and then not being willing to go along with constraints that have evolved over time on executive power in this area. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I have very mixed feelings about the ways, you know, there has certainly been a pushback internally. You know, I, I said I'm concerned about maybe sources of information drying up, but if anything, the first two months of this administration mm -hmm. have been some of the leakiest of any administration. Mm -hmm. um, and, 
you know, I, I find that somewhat discomforting. I, that, that's not mm -hmm. what I would want to rely on as a structure uh, for access to information about government is, a, you know, a, a executive agencies right. that feel free to kind of buck executive authority. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, at least for the moment, fine with it, but I, but I have long-term concerns over whether that's sustainable or whether that creates the right, you know, structure for the protection of individual liberty. Yeah. What What about um, the White House news access? Is there, uh, yeah. are there any real legal issues there, or is that yeah, again just... Yeah, there are. You know, uh, your courts have said, lower courts, not yet the Supreme Court, that there is uh, a, uh, a kind of qualified right of access to White House press briefings when they are held open to <coughs> the press which isn't to say that everyone's entitled to a one-on-one -on -one th with the president, but it is to say that if the press is holding a White House briefing, it can't arbitrarily exclude press organizations. One of the reasons why I didn't list that in this list is I actually think that if that becomes a regular feature of White House press briefings, that uh, uh, media outfits with particular political bents are uh, kept out, I think that issue will get to the courts, and I think that it'll be resolved in the way that we all expect it should be by the courts. And so I'm not as concerned mm -hmm. with that at the moment. Uh, and for the same reason, I'm not as concerned with uh, the kind of campaign promise to open up the libel laws. I think the courts, you know, will rise to that challenge. Um, I don't know yet how concerned to be about the kind of softer threat to the press, about the, you know, the attempt to delegitimize uh, mainstream media. Uh, you know, it, one could argue that, again, over the past few months, if anything, you've seen um, a media that is, you know, awoken, <laughs> that, that mm -hmm. has been, um, you know, more robust in its coverage of, and, and more skeptical of executive power than it had been over the last eight years. So I'm not so concerned about that yet, although that's not something that would get to the courts, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, at least not in an obvious way. Um, so Tom, actually, uh, can I turn to you just on this question of executive power writ large and putting this administration um, in some historical perspective in terms of development of executive power, um, the extent to which what we're seeing is something in, of an order of magnitude different in assertions of power? Or again, is it just what's coming along with the assertions of power in terms of deviating from existing practices that might be more unusual? But in fact, executive power has been on the rise for quite a while. Uh, sure. Um, I'll take a slightly narrower focus uh, uh, and talk about executive orders. Uh, there have been several references already in the comments to executive orders. If you watch TV with the, any regularity, uh, at least during the weekdays, you'll notice that part, hardly a day goes by that President Trump is not signing an executive order and holding it up for the cameras with his signature and so forth. Uh, so there's been a veritable blizzard of executive orders uh, day after day uh, in a way that I think is quantitatively uh, and to some degree qualitatively different than anything we've seen before. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that under current doctrine this is unconstitutional, but I do think that constitutional arguments played a, have played a critical role in getting us to where we are today with uh, president, uh, government by executive order. Um, so um, let me go back to a uh, constitutional argument that occurred uh, really in the Reagan-Bush one uh, era uh, and I think uh, uh, generates uh, the path we took to where we are today. So uh, the Reagan and Bush one administrations were very keen on uh, the idea of the unitary executive. They wanted to have the president have effective control over the entire executive branch of government, and they were very hostile to some Supreme Court decisions, most prominently a case called Humphrey's Executor versus United States, uh, which in 1935 had said that Congress could limit the president's power to dismiss uh, the head of an, of an independent agency uh, requiring a finding of uh, good cause to dismiss such a head, which effectively restricted the president from terminating uh, such uh, agents at will. And so the Reagan and Bush one administrations argued in various forms, formats uh, and forums to try to um, restore the earlier Myers uh, understanding from 1927 that the president could dismiss at will any executive employee and that this, this was necessary in order to preserve the president's control over the administrative state. Well. Uh, the Congress and the Democrats didn't like this argument. They uh, quibbled about it. They thought this was a power grab by an overly ambitious uh, Republican executive. So they kind of committed themselves to opposition to this constitutional argument. Then the Clinton administration comes along. And uh, what does the Clinton administration do? Well, the Clinton administration is actually very keen on executive power and on presidential control of the administrative state. 
Uh, but they couldn't, uh, they couldn't endorse this idea that uh, you know, the president has the power to dismiss all uh, executive employees at will because they'd already staked out a position that that was hooey that the uh, conservatives had uh, promulgated. Uh, so what, they, what evolved, and this is all documented in a very uh, important Law Review article written by Elena Kagan when she was a professor at Harvard before she became uh, a Supreme Court Justice. Uh, she served in the Clinton administration as an executive uh, White House advisor. Uh, what evolved was something called presidential administration, uh, which uh, the Clinton administration more or less invented. And the key aspect of that was that uh, rather than the president passively sitting back and letting various administrative agencies promulgate regulations and policies, the president would appear uh, in the Rose Garden or in some kind of briefing room as the proponent and uh, author in a, some kind of nebulous sense of uh, pop potentially popular regulatory initiatives. And so the, the easiest, the most prominent example was the uh, the, the uh, attempt to regulate tobacco uh, sales to protect uh, uh, young people from becoming addicted to tobacco. Uh, President Clinton held a press conference announcing that he, his administration was going to protect uh, young people from tobacco and that the FDA was going to uh, was sort of be directed to go ahead and uh, issue these regulations. And so uh, these were called directives. Uh, the White House referred to these as directives. So the pres president would give press conferences or other types of public statements in which uh, the president would take ownership of the uh, regulations uh, of the administration. Um, uh, and um, uh, Kagan, in her article, justifies this on the grounds that the association of the president with the regulatory uh, order will uh, inform the public about what's going on in the complicated administrative state, they'll heighten awareness about these things, and that it would heighten the legitimacy of the regulations because the president would be behind them and the public would understand that the president was the one ultimately accountable for these regulations. Uh, so that was the Clinton administration. Move forward to the Obama administration, uh, and early uh, on the Obama administration tried to do a few different things, but after they lost control of Congress, uh, President Obama very prominently talked about his phone and his pen, and he started uh, replicating the sort of practices of the Clinton administration uh, in uh, basically uh, taking prominent ownership for various regulatory initiatives that were happening uh, within the government. The DAPA uh, program that uh, uh, Christina was talking about and I was mentioning uh, earlier is a very clear example of this. President Obama gave a uh, press conference in which he announced that the DAPA program was going to take place. Uh, uh, he didn't exactly say that he was ordering it. It was actually promulgated by the Department of Homeland Security as a policy statement, uh, but uh, there was an attempt to sort of associate the president with this uh, initiative and many opponents of the initiative then referred to it as an executive order and referred to it as a presidential uh, command and so forth. So what Donald Trump seems to be doing to me is he's taking the uh, Clinton-Obama tactic of, uh, of uh, presidential directives and has sort of uh, heightened it to the level of the executive order. So uh, there's really no legal distinction between these directives and executive orders, and, uh, I don't think, in, in the domestic sphere at least. Uh, but uh, they sound more like a command. They sound more like something that a general would tell, you know, the army to do or something like that. Uh, and they're frequently written in sort of uh, compulsory language. Although, as some of the discussions have indicated, if you read the details, they sort of tiptoe around uh, going out on a limb too far and doing something that the president doesn't have any legal authority uh, to do. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Peter Strauss, has written extensively about some of the uh, weaknesses or, or, re or, or downside risks of this type of presidential administration. I tend to agree with him on this point. Um, uh, briefly, I think the problem is that it sort of transforms the administrative process into a purely political process. So um, uh, once the president issues an executive order to an agency to promulgate a regulation regulating tobacco or uh, cutting off uh, funding for ab abortions or, or, you know, or, or something like that or, or dealing with this, this problem of sanctuary cities, uh, the relevant agency that actually has the legal authority uh, to regulate in this area really doesn't have any choice but to do what the president says. So if there's a rulemaking process with notice and comment, it becomes a kind of charade. Uh, the agency doesn't have any interest in listening to what people say, what evidence people bring to bear about these policies because the bottom line has already been announced by the president. Um, and um, 
judicial review uh, may be uh, cut off as well. Uh, now, the president himself is not subject to the Administrative Procedure Act, so you can't sue the president under the APA for issuing an executive order. Uh, so you might think, well, you could, at least you can get judicial review of these agency decisions that have been undertaken pursuant to the president's uh, executive order. Uh, uh, but that may not uh, actually happen. Uh, the D.C. Circuit, in a decision in 2012 called Shirley, S-H-E-R-L-E-Y versus Sibelius, uh, to me an astonishing decision, excused um, uh, the uh, HHS Department of responding to comments in the rulemaking because the rulemaking had been directed by an executive order of the president, specifically President Obama, and therefore the agency had no discretion but to issue the rule, and therefore there was no point in responding to the comments. Uh, so it could be that uh, a government by executive order will not only uh, turn the administrative process into a charade, eliminating the agency's expertise, eliminating uh, realistic public participation, might also cut off judicial review. Uh, so uh, what we would have is a purely politicized process uh, in which uh, regulation is being directed by uh, operatives in the White House uh, and um, uh, the benefits of legality and of public participation and of uh, agency expertise uh, would be tossed overboard. It's too soon to say that that's what's going to happen. None of this is unconstitutional, I don't think, under current doctrine. Uh, we made a mistake back in 1935 with Humphrey's executor, and the Supreme <laughs> Court doesn't have the backbone to go back and undo that mistake. Uh, so um, uh, uh, let's just hope we survive without uh, uh, going too, down, too far down the drain <laughs> uh, uh, of the uh, consequences that I think may emerge from uh, uh, substituting executive orders for legitimate ad administrative processes. Uh, Tom, can I follow up on a couple of those? The, the Shirley case really is remarkable um, in suggesting you wouldn't have judicial review. In, the, in other cases, like Sierra Club or some other cases, the way the courts have often dealt with background presidential involvement is just to ignore it, right? To, to look at the record that was before the agency and see if that record was enough to support it. Yeah, um, presidential comments uh, in rulemaking do not have to be placed on the record. Right. Um, but, but in other words, it's not that they've um, said it would close off judicial review. They've actually just said the fact that the president was involved won't disqualify it, but they'll do the ordinary judicial review. And it would be particularly interesting if they took this road of Shirley because then the kind of move that we're seeing in immigration or others where the courts may be pushing back for some norm enforcement would be really cut off at the knees because you wouldn't even have the ordinary administrative law scrutiny that's usually available as a mechanism for responding, and frequently in administrative law, for those of you who have taken it, you know, the court will dial up or dial down based on its sense of whether or not there's something sneaky afoot or not, um, or whether the agency has really done a good job and is being careful or um, hasn't, right? Yeah, back in the days of the Sierra, this is Sierra Club versus the Costle case way back in the 1970s uh, involving uh, coal burning power plants, but back in those days, the, the concern was that the president's uh, staff would pick up the phone and call the agency and say, you know, the president would really like you to go easy on the coal industry. Uh, that was the big concern. Now it's all above board. Yeah. You know, the president has this uh, uh, televised uh, session where he signs the executive order and shows it to the cameras and, uh, and the agency reads the executive order and they go marching off and doing exactly what the president says. It's all above board. It just sort of completely cuts out the meaningful administrative process. Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to mention when you're talking about uh, Humphrey's executor, and I'm pretty sure, by the way, Peter isn't here, but I'm pretty sure he disagrees with you about Humphrey's executor there um, well, on it. He's wrong day. about that. He was <laughs> right about presidential administration. Um, but there's an interesting case um, going on in the D.C. Circuit. It's currently on Bank uh, called PHH for Corporation versus CFPB. Um, it involves the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau, um, and there was a panel decision uh, written by Judge Kavanaugh that held the structure of the CFPB um, to be unconstitutional. Um, it, the structure, for those of you who don't know, the agency has a single director. Um, it's an agency that has a whole lot of power, has an uh, independent budget, um, uh, and um, uh, is subject to some forms of, of oversight by another entity that was created by Dodd-Frank. The CFPB was created by Dodd-Frank, but not um, uh, uh, by a two-thirds vote to overturn its rule. So it's, it's got a lot of insulation, um, but what it doesn't have is the traditional makeup of an independent regulatory commission, which is a multi-member body, often bipartisan. Um, and so in this uh, panel opinion, 
Judge Kavanaugh argued that the um, for cause removal uh, protection that the director of the CFPB uh, enjoyed was unconstitutional um, and significantly different from the kind of commission structure that was upheld in Humphrey's executor um, and that the court has sanctioned. Um, and now the, the DC Circuit has taken that case en banc um, uh, for consideration. This is actually kind of interesting in terms of dynamics with the Trump administration's Department of Justice. Um, the Trump administration's Department of Justice, um, which had been defending um, the CFPB structure before, um, has come in and said they actually do agree that the CFPB structure is unconstitutional, but that the panel's decision, which took the remedial approach of just taking away the for-cause removal protection, was adequate to deal with the constitutional problem. Um, and the CFPB, I believe, has independent litigating authority at the DC Circuit level, but not at the Supreme Court. Um, uh, and can't take it up to the court. So it's gonna be interesting to see what happens if the DC Circuit affirms the um, decision of the panel, then the case isn't really gonna go any further. Nobody um, would have the ability to, to who, or interest to bring it up. But if the DC Circuit on banc overturns the panel, then we may see this case going forward uh, to the Supreme Court. Jess, did you wanna? I was just gonna add a, a sort of a footnote, I think, to Tom's points, which um, is about the sort of the absence of the, the, the political part of this legal story and the rise of polarization in the political polarization um, in the era that, that you're focusing on with respect to the Clinton through Obama presidencies, because I think it actually puts a lot of pressure on and may make more important this distinction that you mentioned between executive orders or presidential directives, call them what you will, um, where the president is purporting to command some kind of uh, performance by an agency versus using precatory language, language that suggests that an agency might want to take a look at something or might think about doing something. As you say, beginning with Clinton, a lot of this uh, presidential administration was, it was a Rose Garden performance. It was an attempt to claim credit for things happening since there was no ability to move a legislative agenda. Um, with President Obama, it also seemed um, maybe less about credit claiming, but also about trying to move an agenda through the administrative state, but, but framed in terms of um, aligning with agencies and trying to get them to do things rather than ordering them to do things, which might not have seemed that important since in the time of um, very intense polarization in all of these administrations, we had presidents pretty much able to control agencies simply by point, appointing people to, to run those agencies who were aligned with their ideologies and with their perspectives. Um, and so the move that we may be seeing, even as these executive orders that Trump is putting out are littered with the usual executive order language to the extent permitted by law and all of the usual um, phrases that are being cut and pasted in to the extent they are actually saying shall, must, rather than may, consider. When I worked at um, the Office of Legal Counsel, we very carefully went through each line of the executive orders and looked for it. Does it say shall? Does it say must? Does it say may? It was a real exercise um, in, in sort of close reading that may not be happening right now. And to the extent that's not happening, uh, we may see uh, teed up, possibly, for judicial or other resolution, the question of how far the president can command versus simply uh, suggest. And, and that may really matter, including with respect to the Centel opinion in, in the Shirley case or, or otherwise, just how much uh, that, that command can be a command. Um, I think, uh, given the time, why don't we throw it open for questions? And I mean, there's, there are other issues that we could opine on, but love to hear your questions and interest. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Um, the, um, I don't think that uh, Judge Gorsuch is in favor of dismantling the administrative state. Uh, I'd be rather surprised if he would say that. Um, uh, he has spoken critically about Chevron, and I think uh, toward the end of the Obama administration, you began to see that uh, uh, conservative judges uh, who had previously been ardent Chevron supporters were beginning to bail out. Uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's some correlation between um, the uh, president that appointed a judge or justice uh, and the current administration's presidency and whether they support or oppose Chevron because Chevron is generally seen as a pro-administrative agency doctrine. One would predict as a political scientist that now that we have a nominally Republican president, um, uh, 
uh, and, and at least some made many conservative appointees, uh, that suddenly the conservative judges would rediscover the beauties of the Chevron doctrine uh, once these agencies start cranking out regulations. Uh, but that, that remains to be seen. Um, the, the hamburger argument basically is that Chevron uh, in introduces a systematic bias in that uh, you have the government versus the individual and the courts are deferring to the government so therefore the individual is uh, being uh, systematically uh, discriminated against uh, through judicial review. That's one way of looking at it. The original way of looking at Chevron was that if the statute is genuinely ambiguous and we don't know what it means, is it better to have an agency interpret the statute that presumably has a lot of information and insight as to how the statute works and what its purposes are, or to have judges interpret it, particularly when you have you know, uh, 12 different circuits around the country that might interpret it differently and you'd have uh, lots of heterogeneity in terms of what government policy would be. So it's kind of a trade-off between coherence and uniformity on the one hand versus maybe uh, the government getting a leg up a little bit on the other hand, and so you'd have to trade off these somewhat incommensurate ideals to decide whether you like Chevron or don't like Chevron. Um, I tend to come down in favor of coherence and uniformity myself. Philip Hamburger uh, is very concerned about the seemingly uh, biased nature of the Chevron uh, de deference doctrine, which uh, just puts a greater weight on that than I do. Um. Well, I mean, uh, the federal bureaucracy is, en is enormous, uh, uh, and uh, many of the, I think probably about 90% of them vote Democratic. Uh, so, um, you know, at, at the adjudicata adjudication level, at the sort of uh, low-level policymaking level, there are lots of room for pushback against somebody like Trump. Uh, so that's one form of resistance, I guess. I'm not sure what else you're thinking about. Uh, Obviously, if the heads of the agencies can't be dismissed except for cause, then they can uh, resist presidential initiative initiatives quite a bit. What I'd actually like to ask you guys in on this one, because um, uh, the, the question of what kind of resistance is available, I think, is very much what um, you know, we were talking about in terms of uh, the uh, administrative um, uh, norms and practices and leaks is one main form of uh, that we're seeing <laughs> of resistance. Um, uh, so do you, do you have any thoughts on? I mean, I, I'm not sure that, you know, I, I don't know what more I have to add from before. I, I mean, I think we're likely to continue to see that, that kind of soft resistance. The question that, you know, I uh, am very curious to see resolved and play out over the next few months is the extent to which that's a sustainable model for resistance and in the longer term beyond that, whether that's one that we actually want. Um, you know whether you want this ability for the uh, for you know relatively low-level government employees uh, uh, to influence high-level policy you know so easily, um, and if that is the case, then I think it, it may also you know cause another kind of uh, blowback from uh, that w should be cause for concern, which is greater leak prosecutions, greater crackdown on. Uh, you know, surve surveillance of journalistic contacts with the, with, um, you know, uh, with the executive government. And I think that's, that's another cause for concern. So, I, you know, the, the structural questions are really, are really hard, and I'm not mm -hmm. at all convinced that this is the right model. Um, and I, you know, uh, it's an amazing moment to be watching it play out, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know what the right answer is. Do you have thoughts, Yanni? Yeah, I don't, I don't have the sort of magic um, uh, potion either, but I guess in addition to the usual channels of sort of leaks or low-level um, the, the folks who actually do the work on the day-to-day -day basis, either dragging their feet or trying um, to, to derail certain programs, which we might well see happening. I'll just add a footnote to that, that a lot of the programs, um, uh, environmental programs in particular, um, but we see with immigration as well, that are 
being targeted um, don't depend on the federal government alone. They do depend on the states, and so that's been a uh, uh, a reason for some of the state litigation that we've already seen now, and a reason for the state litigation coming from a different group of states um, under the Obama administration. Um, but it may uh, yield uh, some state lack of cooperation on the ground in carrying out these programs. It may yield new lawsuits. It may yield some new state litigation. So um, we could see, at least in some programs, not all, again, this is not a panacea, but the number of actors who have to be involved in all of these different uh, policy areas potentially gum up the works, I think. Um, one, uh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. This is definitely one that we have to sort of see what happens over time. There, there were two thoughts that I had that I just wanted to flag. One actually relates, uh, it's unfortunate Christina had to go, um, because in her book, one of the, the, the points that she discusses in the background of DAPA is that part of the reason why President Obama had to take this step, or felt he had to take the step of DAPA, was because of resistance from the ICE agents um, to the priorities that had been set by memo by their um, by, by the head of the ICE uh, 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 agency. Um, and um, uh, you know, these are uh, you know, career bureaucrats doing you know, what they thought their job was, which was enforcement, um, and really resisting the idea that they were going to turn a blind eye to what they saw as law breaking. Um, uh, and you end up with a lot of low-level, street-level discretion um, and use of enforcement power. And it raises the question of whether, going back to you, Alex, you know, some kinds of executive and presidential control may actually be very important for accountability um, and, and what we want. The other point that we just haven't talked about, um, and I think perhaps because we just don't have a constitutional lexicon for it, but it seems to me the elephant in the room is the fact that the EPA is going to lose, potentially, a massive amount of its budget. Right? Um, many agencies that do regulation, one of the ways you can control them, that Congress has traditionally controlled them, is through funding and cutting it off. Um, and you, you know, from a constitutional framework, we tend to say, well, Congress has the appropriations power and you know, it's a negotiation. But there's another way in which we end up with a lot of very important laws that were enacted on the books that agencies are incapable of enforcing. And that might, we might need, again, to have a, an expanded constitutional understanding um, to start thinking about that and how we, how we engage with that, not from a judicial perspective, but something beyond just ordinary politics, perhaps, um, uh, for discussing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, one oh, quick yeah, point yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'd be re remiss if I didn't say this, and I don't think he's here anymore, but Professor Blasey was here earlier, and so students in his class right now will know that, you know, uh, th this, you could view this all as part of Madison's design, mm -hmm. the idea that the, the best way to prevent uh, majorities or, you know, uh, counterfeiting minorities from, from commanding executive power in a tyranni uh, tyrannical way is to gum up the system. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you, you want that inertial pull back toward, um, you know, away from all kinds of rapid change. Maybe that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. thought I should just say that to push back against what I was saying earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you had your hand. 
Do you want to take, you're, you're the most familiar with mm. national security. I mean, you almost never see courts uh, uh, performing national security review in a way that exhibits any kind of bite. Uh, you know, if you look back at the litigation over the last 15 years in any context in which a national security justification is called to be scrutinized by a court, the, the deference is, you know, kind of deafening. <laughs> um, rarely do they, ever, do they ever, you know, pull the curtain back, which is what I thought was one of the most interesting things about uh, the argument in front of the Ninth Circuit, and, and I believe it kind of made its way into the decision itself, which was some questioning of the idea whether there really was a national security justification. You just don't see that. Um, and that may be kind of part of this inertial pull back toward the middle. Um, and, I, and I don't, you know, whether that will last beyond this kind of initial phase of resistance or not, I think is a really important question. Um, and, you know, I personally, having litigated a number of national security cases post 9-11, uh, and having been frustrated by a judicial unwillingness uh, to meaningfully scrutinize national security policies, wouldn't mind greater judicial involvement. You know, having spent many years at the ACLU, I'm a, a strong believer in courts as protectors of individual liberty. Um, uh, but, but I think it's important to think through uh, the kind of long-term consequences of that. Um, my own instinct is that it's, it's probably a good uh, change. I'm not sure that what change we've seen will last. Um, I think it's more a reaction to Trump the person rather than um, a kind of shift in how courts are actually thinking about their jobs. Um, but I think it's a great question. I, I cannot conceive of a world in which the uh, stated purpose of the second travel ban would be subject to judicial uh, trial. I mean, the, the, it, be, it could be an all, it's all a pretext, I suppose. Yeah, it's a, you know, fulfillment of a campaign pledge and so forth. But the stated rationale for the travel ban is that these six countries are so chaotic that they don't have adequate procedures for issuing uh, visas to people that have been vetted as not being a national security risk. Are we going to have trials in which courts are going to try to si decide whether or not Libya has an adequate internal you know, security system in order to uh, screen people for visas? I don't think that makes any sense. Uh, you know, the, the court's going to decide that correctly or it's not going to be embarrassing to our foreign policy relations or something like that. I think there are good reasons why we'd want to have uh, the executive branch decide these matters based on confidential information that they have through their uh, extended network of uh, contacts overseas. Uh, and the courts have good reasons not to get involved in those sorts of inquiries. So um, if that's what's in the offing, I think it's a, a, a little step backwards. Yeah, in the back. Um, so, uh, uh, just so I'm clear about the precise, I mean, unfortunately I can see a, a number of possible constitutional crises arising, so, um, <laughs> uh-huh. Right. Um, well, I mean, it's a really interesting question because it actually is a, is a real-time example of this phenomena of uh, you know, presidential oversight and control as being a good thing as well as a bad thing. Um, the way you protect and make sure that the law is enforced on the ground is by hierarchical control to some extent, right? I mean, that's one of its main virtues. Um, and so at the same time as we're, you know, you, you, you're, the, the idea of sort of the resistance at the low level is very appealing, um, that resistance is also then resistance potentially on the other side to a court order and from Superior saying, no, you have to allow uh, uh, people in. Um, I, I do think that it was enhanced at the time of the first executive order um, by the lack of consultation, the lack of knowledge. I mean, it was just a, 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 a terribly, terribly rolled out um, executive order. One of the things that, that is interesting is just that, there, you know, in, in the agencies, it's always a problem staffing up, but we do seem to have very few of the not top level, but very critical um, below them level of appointees that can really help make sure that these kinds of policies when they come or decisions or you have to change behavior are actually implemented. So there may still be that kind of administrative vacuum um, where uh, you know, even people who have been career but are seen as being uh, 
um, either you know, big in the Obama administration or not trusted to sort of implement decisions like that. So you may have those kinds of problems going on. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, it's interesting that one bedrock principle that seems to have become established uh, in our country throughout administrations is that the executive will always obey a judicial judgment. Uh, uh, and we're entering a period now where the principal check on the Trump administration is, is the federal judiciary because it's highly staffed with Democratic appointees at this point. Um, uh, so it's not inconceivable that there could be some judicial judgment uh, issued which the president would declare illegitimate uh, and there'd be a defiance of this judgment and then you'd have a, a very interesting standoff that we haven't seen before. Um, it, it is, however, worth mentioning that one of the members of the Ninth Circuit unanimous panel indeed was Republican. Just, not just Democrats might be upset by what Trump is doing. Might be some Republicans upset. <laughs> Senior judge. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I didn't go quite back that far, but you're right, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I can put it in a um, global perspective, but I was really struck in this conversation how Congressman Trump and any of your um, colleagues um, came. And so um, I think um, what we're looking for in Turkey, I think for inflation, is how does this party want to think about um, about policing the world? Um, do we think, okay, we're not only going to defund these five courts, and we're going to sort of have a true Can I give you just one data point, maybe following up on that, Alice, just an interesting one. At the end of this year, the FISA Amendments Act uh, of 2008, which is the uh, statute that codified executive warrantless wiretapping of international communications, is scheduled to sunset. Um, and uh, I, you know, one of the concerns that had been expressed about it for a long time under the Bush administration and then the Obama administration 
uh, was that it uh, ceded a significant amount of discretionary surveillance authority to the government. Um, and you are now starting to see some concern about that, given who is heading that government. And it, it has come up recently, um, you know, the, the discussion about wiretapping of Trump Tower is in large part a discussion about incidental surveillance that occurs under foreign intelligence surveillance authorities, um, you know, which is kind of uh, intelligence community lingo for Americans getting swept up in surveillance directed at foreigners abroad. Uh, and it's possible that there would be some momentum <laughs> to uh, implement some reforms of that law. I wouldn't expect much. I mean, but it, it's possible that, you know, the recent controversy, um, you know, will add to that, that call for reform. I'm very skeptical that, you know, what we've seen over the last 24 and 48 hours where these laws have been the focus, I'm very skeptical that that um, momentum will last, will carry through until, you know, December 31st, which is when the sunset is. Um, but it's an interesting data point to, to your question. The other side of the coin is whether, you know, Trump and the Republicans will get anything done through the Congress. Uh, I mean, the conventional political science uh, is that uh, when you have a heavy lift in terms of the legislation, it's critical that the President and the White House get very actively involved in lobbying Congress, calling up people that are sitting on the fence or reluctant to go forward, making threats, promises, and so on. All the T's been involved in all this stuff. Um, and um, there's a lot of evidence that Trump, uh, you know, has, has no background in legislation, has no background in government. He seems to have a fairly short attention span. Um, and um, he's diverted fairly easily by other things. Um, and so I think there's a very real question as to whether any of these heavy lifts like reforming the Affordable Care Act or passing this tax reform or this infrastructure bill and so forth, very real questions whether any of this is going to get done at all, uh, simply because you're not going to have a White House that's capable of uh, herding the cats together to get the necessary votes. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I mean, you know, uh, all we need is a couple of more flints, uh, and the EPA's budget is going to go back up again, and there's going to be a new emphasis on, you know, uh, making sure we've got clean water, clean air, and so on and so forth. There's a tremendous uh, demand for these services. The only way to deliver them is through having an effective central government overseeing these processes, and they need the funding to get it done. So uh, it's a fantasy to think that we can disassemble the administrative state. I mean, I, I think that's right when taken to the extreme, certainly, but I think there is cause for concern about, about big cuts um, to certain agencies. We're already seeing in, a, in the sort of Congress executive story a little bit of pushback from some members of Congress about certain programs that the Trump budget would seek to defund, but not all of them and not most of the environmental um, uh, programs. So the current doctrine, as I think, think Jillian was suggesting, doesn't really offer good tools for this. We have our later in time rule, so if Congress now doesn't want to fund things that it said that the agencies should be doing five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, that's often the end of the story. But I think um, the status of appropriations in our sort of legal landscape, our constitutional landscape, hasn't been thoroughly theorized. As you say, hasn't been thoroughly worked through. Appropriations both are and aren't normal law. Un unfortunately, for purposes of re-theorizing them, they are often the only way anything gets done in this time of polarization and difficulty of passing legislation. And so we get these omnibus, massive appropriations um, uh, uh, bills, which may put some more pressure on giving them legal force beyond uh, uh, what this kind of argument might suggest. But I think it's a good area to be thinking about and to be offering new arguments. I mean, you all know that um, constitutional law, among other things, is always an argument. And so when new conditions arise and the situation changes, we need new thinking and new kinds of arguments. And we shouldn't, any of us up here or, or out there, be complacent about the doctrine says this, the DC Circuit said that, end of story. So I think that's all I would say on that. Any other? Yes, Joanna. 
Well, no, I think, uh, I think uh, Flint was a bipartisan uh, exercise in finger pointing. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was always somebody else that was responsible, but the Republicans were busy pointing fingers and the Democrats were busy pointing fingers. Yeah, but that's a bring up the states, too, then. It's not clearly that you, yeah, you get federal funding out of it. Right. I'm going to display a certain amount of cynicism. My guess is that if we're at a full complement of nine with Gorsuch on the Supreme Court, the and the Ninth Circuit say has upheld the Hawaii court, um, the Supreme Court would overturn that. And that's me simply looking at the 4-4 in Texas and in other cases and thinking you add one more, I don't think Gorsuch is going to be um, someone who's going to be looking behind the face of the order to find the uh, religious discrimination to be the most sympathetic argument. Um, but I may be going out on a limb. You guys may have different views. No, I think I agree with that. Um, and uh, the other thing I would add is that I think the Supreme Court, regardless of the political uh, affiliation of the different justices, might view the issue in a slightly broader context that we're really dealing here with the powers of the president as an office. Uh, and uh, do we really want to establish, you know, uh, a precedent that suggests that, you know, district courts can invalidate presidential orders, which are undertaken pursuant to an express delegation of power by Congress. It's uh, Section 112F of the Immigration and National Nationality Act. It's been around since 1952. So uh, I, I think the court might view the issue in a slightly broader lens that we're not just dealing with Trump and all of his excessive verbal statements that are offensive, but we are worried about the power of the presidency as an institution, which might incline Breyer-type judges to maybe view this somewhat more differently than the lower courts do. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, it's interesting also because we actually had a case about um, relating somewhat to this Vacancy Act case that came down yesterday from the Supreme Court. I mean, one of the statutes that deals with that is the Vacancy Act, and it has a presumption about sort of an acting being the, the first deputy. There comes a point at which, however, um, uh, you, know, you, may, you may not have people who have any degree of authority in the agency to be able, in that role, um, and it does make it a lot harder to get things done um, when you don't have a political appointee. Um, do you guys have... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's an, I think that's a possibility, but it's a f kind of a funny game to play, too, because to achieve the objectives that the administration wants to achieve in a lot of areas, they actually need to have people either overturning things from the past or taking um, uh, enforcement or rulemaking or any number of other administrative tools in a, in a new direction. And so, I mean, they could calibrate it perhaps per, um, per each office and what they want to achieve. I don't see that kind of nuance at the moment. Um, but, and in the meantime, you'll have people who are holdovers from the Obama administration, therefore making decisions in the absence of new uh, appointees in most of these roles. So uh, I, I do think it's possible, but it's a, a, a pretty high stakes game, I think, for the Trump administration to try to play. Oh, you had had, yeah. 
Um, I don't think so. I mean, yeah, I, I don't I, think so. You know, the, the, uh, that, was, that was briefed in Texas versus the United States, and the court split four to four, so we don't know uh, how they were thinking about that. The, the government's response was that there's no need ever to reach that issue because uh, as long as the uh, act is being challenged as being inconsistent with the statute, uh, you would always uh, invalidate it as inconsistent with the statute rather than reaching the take care clause uh, that the president's willfully violating the statute, basically. So it's kind of hard to imagine a case where you would have to get to the take care clause uh, in the absence of there also being a statutory ground for ruling, I think. But I'd like, I, I think you're right in that, again, if we get past thinking that constitutional law is simply what courts tell us and what is enforceable in court, and we think about the Constitution structure, I do think you can say the failure to staff um, an administration is a failure uh, of the duty to take care. Um, it's just not necessarily a judicially enforceable one. Yeah. Uh, I thought I saw a hand over, over here. La one last question from anyone? Okay. I need Richard Befault. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> well, I think the real problem in some of these cases had been the standing question of who could who could have standing to bring this kind of claim about the emoluments clause or, or, or other kinds of conflicts of interest. Recently, Cork, <laughs> some of you may know the restaurant on 14th Street in DC, filed the uh, church because they were looking for a long time rather than having an interest group or some uh, group that wasn't directly financially affected um, to bring these kinds of claims. Has filed a suit, so we'll see what happens. I think there's still going to be um, real justiciability questions, but uh, maybe in keeping with the take care answer, that doesn't necessarily answer the actual constitutional objection. It just may pose a lot of roadblocks to a judicial resolution. I looked up emolument in an old dictionary, and uh, <laughs> basically, it, 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 at the time of the Constitution's drafting, it meant accepting a salary. So uh, I think, um, you know, unless Trump is accepting a salary from the Russian state, uh, and who knows, uh, um, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, having people stay in his hotel would be an emolument or something like that. Presentism. Um, <laughs> there, there's a much broader yeah. group of offenders who are after it in terms of the idea of setting the tone um, against the enforcement of the statute and the things like that. Um, but, so, uh, but I do think there are real questions about even the litigation that's now in the broader constraints we have about um, Congress um, being a body that addresses real questions of what the country or law is about to do. You know, if someone recognizes that the public body is So with that, um, I, we are done. I'm sure we'll be continuing to have more and more conversations um, on these subjects to come. Thank you very much. Thank you.